in the 19th chapter of Genesis. It's a rather lengthy section. The destruction of Sodom and the daughters of Lot. But I have this desire that we have a proper understanding of the text and that we arrive at the same kind of conclusions that God did Amen. about Lot. Amen. About how Jesus did and Peter did. They both they, they both brought Lot up yes. and didn't have any criticism of him. Even though there would be some things difficult to understand, I'll tell you up right up front, it would be difficult to understand, but we're, we're going to wade through it and I do my best to account for the activity without approving of it. Now you will remember that three messengers, angels unawares, had visited Abraham Announced that Isaac was going to be born the next year, about about on springtime the next year, and two of them went on to Sodom, and Abraham stayed behind and dialogued with this other was a representative of God, and he had pled, he'd asked if God was going to destroy the wicked, the righteous with the wicked. Any reason with it? No, no resolution was struck. God just said, if you find ten, if we find ten, we won't destroy it. But you can tell by the what happens after this that there must have been considerable dialogue took place there between Abraham because he it doesn't he didn't actually tell Abraham I'm going to destroy the city, but there, that must have been in there somewhere. So now we're on the other side of this, so we see our Sodom, and two two men left, but when you, when you open up, it's two angels coming. There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground and said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, wash your feet, ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. They said, Nay, we, we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned into him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. <clears throat> but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compass the house round, both young and old and young, all the people from every quarter. They called out unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. Said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you, and you do, and do ye to them as good as in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men, those <coughs> men that were angels, pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they worried themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, <clears throat> Hast thou 
hear any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which he which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning rose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Rise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou at all in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O, oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? My soul shall live. He said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah fire, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities of, in which Lot dwelt. Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father's old. There is not a man in the earth to come in to us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine. We will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. They made their father drink wine that night. The firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she rose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night. Go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. <clears throat> and they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger rose and lay with him. He perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. Thus were both daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. 
and the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. That's, that's the report. Now the report was actually written several centuries after the occurrence by Moses, so this is an edited report. The Holy Spirit edited it. So if there needed to be something said, assuming and things like this mm -hmm. yeah, you can count on it the Holy Spirit would have said it Amen. so I'm going to take the record just as it's given yeah. and reason upon it now this text is about of course an epochal destruction the, the only one of its kind in the history of the world. The first judgment of sin was on two individuals and their seed, that's Adam and Eve. The second was upon one individual, Cain and his seed. The third was the destruction of the entire world with eight souls spared. The fourth was a scattering of peoples that were united for the wrong reason. And the fifth would be the destruction of several cities. See, in the book of Genesis, we read more about judgment of sin. You don't read a whole lot about mercy. and You, you just don't. You get a little later, there'll be some hints of it, but he's shaping your idea about God. It's imperative that people fear God. You don't mess around with God. Amen. That's what you, that's what we're learning here. Whether you're two people or whether you're one person or whether you're the whole world or whether you're a couple of cities. It's about every kind of social unit you can have. Individual, family, cities, world. You know, so it's about the same. God doesn't diminish the seriousness of sin because it's a city or because it's a family, because it's a world. He's a God of judgment. In fact, Moses reminded the people in Deuteronomy, all his ways are judgment. God, and we'll be careful how I say this, but God doesn't function without judging. When you come to God, you can't come to him apart from God the judge. In fact, it says that in Hebrews 12, where it says we have come unto, and mentions all the personalities, and it is that and to God the Judge. Amen. And the psalmist reminds us that His throne was prepared for judgment. It's one of the reasons God reigns is to judge, decipher what the case is, and to take appropriate action. It's even written in Psalm 33, 5 and 37, 28 that he loves judgment. So God derives a great deal of satisfaction with judging because he has evaluated the situation as it is and has meted out the appropriate response. Now Isaiah said that God will be exalted in judgment. So it's God's judgments that sets him up in our perception in your perception, sets him up high, says judgments. So if you, you can't let anybody convince you of a view of God that doesn't have this aspect of judgment, because this is the way God is. So if someone said we shouldn't be harsh, blah, 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 well, that, that's just human talk. That's all that is. The scriptures have spoken too much about this. The Lord lives in judgment and in righteousness. See, those are jo joined together. If you haven't been damned, it's because God judged not to do it. 
If you've been saved, it's because God judged Amen. to do it. Yeah. That's how serious salvation is. See, it wasn't just like something automatic. I said I'd save the people. It isn't like that. Someone comes to God, he has to evaluate, is this person honest? Do they have a contrite heart? See, he judges all of that, that we can't judge. We, that, well, this is out of our domain. God exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. That's Jeremiah 9, 24. The text that says, let him that delight, delight in this, that he knows me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment. See, some people can't, could never put that together. And all these things are lived out in this, uh, in this text. Now, there's a lot revealed in this judgment that I want to try to introduce. We're going to see how that some people can't be halted in their quest for indulgence. Even holy angels can't stop them. Well, they could stop them, but you know what I mean. That can make them change their mind. There's some people like that. You may have people you've worked with for a long time try to change their mind. You find you couldn't do it. Why? Because there's some people in that category. Nobody who knows the Lord rejoices that there's people in this category, but that is the way it is. God's not going to damn anybody that there was not any other alternative available. That's what you got to see. He already told Abraham, if I can find ten, just ten righteous, I will not carry this out. So God's not anxious, but there are some places he just can't find anything worth sparing the people. Now you you have to determine how you're going to think about that. Now again, I want to underscore that where a proper view of God is being formed. We're going through Genesis. It's shaping how you think about God. So I'll just mention some things that we've seen so far. We've seen that he accepts. He accepted Abel and Enoch and Noah. We've seen... He assesses, this is God's nature. He blesses. He can be angered. He chooses. He clothes. He communicates. He creates. He curses. He directs. He disperses. He distinguishes. Cain and Abel, Enoch in the world, Noah in the world, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. He distinguishes. He excludes. Adam and Eve were excluded from the guard. Cain excluded. Hagar and Ishmael were excluded. He includes Noah's household for the sake of Noah, Abraham's seed, and in our text, Lot's daughters. He keeps, he makes determinations, he decides to do things that can't, can't be altered, and he protects, he rejects, he reveals, he rewards, and he sends angels, and he sustains. See, those are just some of the things that we've picked up on so far in Genesis. This is all presenting to us the real, the real God. Now we've left this place in the plain where Abraham was talking with the Lord's representative about this. and we're, We transport ourselves up to Sodom, and here's the two people that Abraham saw going away. Now we go to Sodom, we see him coming, coming in. Now there are three men that appeared to Abraham, but only two went to Sodom. The other messenger apparently was his fundamental interest was Abraham and the matter of Isaac and things like this. 
and also to divulge this to Abraham so that you'd have a representative who could make an appeal to his gracious nature, see, so that nobody could say in heaven or on earth or under the earth, well, God didn't give the people a chance, sir. See, it's all arranged so God can't be charged with being unjust. This underscores the necessity of understanding the scriptures. Some people, when they read the Bible, they're kind of they're kind of like naive children. They can't figure they can't figure things out. Were they men? Were they angels? They can't figure it out. See, but as you get more of the Word of God in you, you you can figure these things out. Well, God has messengers. He's God doesn't deal with things personally Himself. He's too lofty, and he'd, he'd destroy everybody if it was that was the case. Just his glory, because there's a fire goes up before him, we're told, and destroys it. So this is an accommodation to the frailty of humanity. Now these works, of course, are witnessed by men. They're recorded. See, if God hadn't divulged this to Moses, we'd have never known. We'd have never known this even happened. If God hadn't divulged this to Moses and he wrote it down. So any valid reasoning about this has to be based on what has been revealed. It can't be based on some interpretation or some human conclusion or it has to be based on what God has said wherever he's talked about Lot, Sodom, Gomorrah, wherever he's talked about this, that's the only thing you got to work with. You don't have anything else to work with but that right. in deciphering this incident here. Amen. Now I wanted to say a word about the retrogression of our times because it is like unparalleled. I heard a group of men on the radio talking about this today and they were, they were it was pretty good about the seriousness of the times because there's an underlying ignorance of God and yet people are making conclusions about God and they don't know enough about God they draw a conclusion yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. I underscore this so there are phrases in an environment like this there are phrases that crop up that pretty soon people just accept them like they're in the Bible mm -hmm. I'll mention a few of them unconditional love the free will of man, that phrase is not in the Bible. Free moral agency, uh, eternal security. See, you may con read text and conclude this, but this, these terms are not used. So you can't build a theology around these terms. These can't be building blocks for sound thinking. The thousand year reign of Christ, the Bema Seat Judgment, the New Testament Church, the Plan of Salvation, Self-Esteem, Low Esteem, Limited Atonement, Missions, Personal Evangelism, per Church Planting, and eggs. You could spend, I could spend a week thinking about this. I'd probably come up with hundreds of phrases that people use just as though they were in the Bible. They might ask you, what do you think? And they will give you one of these phrases. What do you think of this? You, you owe no answer to this. Say, well, this is, a, this is a human term. This represents a human conclusion. There's some kind of a thought process that men entered into that they think is based on Scripture, but they come up with a conclusion. It's not a divine conclusion. And then they use that conclusion to build a denomination and an institution. <laughs> and they use that conclusion to separate people Right back to this, the angels they come to the city, they come to the city, and Lot is sitting in the gate. I won't read these, but I give, give you the benefit of what several Bible student men, scholars of the text, what they've said about it, about well, sitting at the gate. He ranges that's all this is a place of judgment when you sit at the gate, so determinations are made there. What I'm more inclined to, and I had it before I read them, was that Lot knows the city 
He's watching for wayfaring people. He doesn't want them to be snared by these wicked men, so he's going to offer them a place to stay. He's thinking about that, about the wickedness of the city. Now, Peter, he, he brings this up, this thing about Lot. He brings this up in his writing. He says that God has spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should afterward live ungodly. See, this is a lesson for all homosexuals. You better pick up on this. Your sin's going to be spelled out. Regardless of people modifying it and saying it's not there. And delivered just Lot, not just Lot doesn't mean only Lot, it means righteous Lot. Amen. Delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Well, how come he got out of there? The Lord knows how to deliver the godly. Yes, amen. He's commenting on Lot. Yes, that's right. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust as Son of Gomorrah into the judgment to be punished. So you notice the thread of Peter's reasoning. Peter, he, when he thought about Lot, he, he drew several conclusions from it. He concluded, first of all, that God saved Noah, the eighth person. And then God turned the city of Son of Gomorrah into ashes which overthrow was intended to be an example to un ungodly people. He delivered or rescued righteous Lot. And the reason for the deliverance is said to be because he vexed his righteous soul every day with, with their unlawful deeds. That is, it grieved him and irritated him and upset him that this kind of thing was going on. And then he draws the conclusion the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. So this text that we're... This is God del delivering the godly out of temptation. Now, given these given these preliminary observations, I think that Lot was positioned at the gate to warn travelers of the iniquity that existed in Sodom and Gomorrah. That seems to me to be what a righteous man would do. He'd have a concern for that. I do not think the day of judgment will be comfortable for those who have taken upon themselves to speak differently of Lot. Yes, that's right. yeah. So as soon as Lot, Lot sees these men approaching, he gets up. That's the same thing Abraham did. It's the same thing Abraham did when he saw the three men. Kind of man. That's right. <laughs> he rose up. He had the same spirit of Abraham. He doesn't know at first they're angels. He doesn't know these are angels. Abraham didn't know either. They didn't look like regular men. There's one reason angels appeared to as men was to bring out what was really in these people. We know that Jesus this way. He says, I was sick and he visited me and so on and so forth. And then he tells them, well, it, it was actually some of his people that they came across and they they denigrated his people. They come across some of God's people. They didn't like the way they acted. They preferred to comment on the wicked. Now this is noted in heaven. I know there's a lot of reasoning that presented on this about how the unrighteous are treated and this sort of thing, and nobody has a license to treat someone in the image of God irrespectively. No one has a right to do that. We understand that. But it's important to know this. God doesn't overlook how his messengers are treated. And ordinarily when angels appeared, it frightened the people, you know. But they knew it was an angel, didn't think it was a man. Well, they thought it was a man, he was he had an appearance of a non-man. <laughs> there was a certain fear that gripped the hearts of the people. 
Now I named some of these. And they, they even include John in the Isle of Patmos. So it wasn't something that, there didn't come a point in time when men could look right on to angels and it not have any effect on them. John, he's at the close of his life and he fell down like a dead man. Well, it had an effect upon him. Now we're told that they arrived at even time. And so a lot immediately offers him some accommodations. And he had to persuade him, no, oh, we'll sleep in the street. Well, no, the angel, nobody would have heard him. You, <laughs> you understand? But this is a, telling you how righteous men oh, you He persuaded him. Now this, uh, this is a similar conduct that's been found out throughout Scripture. Jesus, when he's with the road, two on the road to Emmaus, he made as though he'd go further, and they had to, they had to talk him into staying. That they had to demonstrate they really wanted. Yeah. Listen, there's a lot of people who say they're Christians that would let Jesus go on. Yeah. Now there are. I just hope it's not a part, no one here, but it, they are. And Jesus just, he just, they say, well, that must have been all he wanted <laughs> to let him go. But that's not the way godly people do. When they detect this thing is from the Lord, they'll not let this opportunity escape their attention. So when they came, he, he did what Abraham did. He made him a feast. He didn't, didn't invite him in for a short snack. Made him a feast. It's the same kind of meal Abraham prepared. Remember, it was the same. Yeah. And it was, they didn't say it was inconvenient. I had a lot of things to do today. And that's just not how they thought. Yeah. Now, while they're there, evening draws down. The men of the city surround the house. All of them. From every quarter. Yeah. There were teenagers there. Yeah. There were old men there. They all surrounded the house. Now he's going to confirm to us the nature of sin. When sin gets a hold of a person, and only God knows when this is, I understand. The people are not subject to reasoning. That's why you can't if you reason and you just fell flat on your face, you can't blame yourself and say, if I, maybe if I'd have said this, maybe, no, this isn't, the, this isn't the case. There's a sin that can so dominate a person that no matter what anybody says, they just are determined to do what they're going to do. So the men said, where are these men? Bring them out to us. We may know them. That doesn't mean so we can sit down and learn a little bit more about them, shake their hands, be neighbor. That's not what they were talking about. Some of the other versions, they uh, they spell it out a little bit. <laughs> I don't even feel at liberty to read them. They're that frank, but that's they weren't talking about friendliness. <laughs> now there are some sins that are more aggressive than others. Sodomy is one. Murder, that's another. So we go on rampages, murdering. They're just a, a different category of yep. sin. And so if some nutcase tells you a murder is no worse than her overeating, I mean, this is like a fool you're listening to. So don't answer the fool according to his folly. He doesn't know what he's talking about. There's some sins that are worse. They get, they dominate the person. Sodomy is one of those sins. And there's a lot said about it. I'll read just a couple of these texts. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Even if people say it's okay, it still is an abomination. Amen. Some years ago, a famous movie star, Rock Hudson, died of AIDS. And even in his death, he could not 
control this appetite. He had people, men coming into his house all day, every day, multiple times a day. He could not control this even when he was dying. You say, well, does that happen to everybody? Well, you just stay away from it, and then you don't have to worry about that. If a man lie with woman with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination that shall surely be put to death. Why? So it won't spread. And then there's, uh, there's several others about this. Sodomy, it's an unnatural crime. It violates even the laws of nature. And is it, it is especially reprehensible. Now I want to show here how that this kind of sin is at the bottom of the ring of a ladder of descent. It's down at the bottom. The unique sin. Now it's covered in Romans the first chapter. He covers what happened there. First, they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, so they couldn't see God and things, and they weren't thankful. And as a consequence, God gave them over to the uncleanness of the lusts of their hearts and dishonored themselves in their own bodies. It was, this is a bodily sin. And then it says God gave them up. Unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use. That she... mm -hmm. So sodomy is the result of divine abandonment, at least in this text. Yeah, right. Now this is a, when someone stoops to this sin. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot that has been done. Mm -hmm. And it's not as simple as it seems. And making some simple statement about we ought to love the homosexual and we ought to try and win them to Christ. That's simple to say. Mm -hmm. and I'm not prepared to say that nobody should try and reach them. I would never say that. But if anyone does, they better be careful. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now here's a sin, a sin ladder I call it. A sin. The longer you're under the dominion of sin, the worse it gets. Mm -hmm. So the first, in Romans 1, they didn't glorify God. <coughs> Then they changed the glory of God. They changed the definition of God. Then God abandoned them, and then sodomy broke out. And then reprobacy is the next step. Reprobate means you can't be, you can't be recovered. Uh -huh. These things are known to God. Understand what he says enough. That you gotta, there are certain things you've got to avoid them. And if, you, if this is the only reason... Your children, when they go to school, when they start teaching them about mom and mom and stuff like this, and when in the curriculum mm -hmm. they're teaching this, you got to get on that right away. Yeah, amen. You can't let that. This is, and this is what they're teaching. Yes, it is. Yes. Because sin gets once it just sin's crouching at the door. Remember, God told Cain, yeah. it's crouching at the door, waiting to take over. So we're living in a time when the church is being told that sodomy is no worse than any other sin. We need to love homosexuals. Again, whatever arguments may be put forth, that isn't said in the scripture. So whatever, what you do with it, that's your business. But that just isn't said in the scripture. And you ought not to assume that that's what any statement of scripture means. Because we've got an incident here. That's right. There's an example to those that live ungodly. <laughs> For instance, God told Israel that he loved them. But he did not say that to any other nation. None. None. He said it to Israel. Moses stated it. Prophets reiterated it. But it was not said of any other nation. Now, as I say, what you do with that, that's your business. But that you do have to start with the facts of the case. The only people Jesus told that he loved were his disciples. Now, I know he saw the rich man, he loved him, but he didn't tell the rich man that. He didn't tell him that. 
the apostles are nowhere pictured as telling the unsaved that God loves them. We've got examples in Scripture of the apostles speaking to unsaved people. Paul did it at Antioch of Pisidia, Lystra and Athens and Corinth and Ephesus. Did it to Felix, did it to Agrippa. He never talked like this. But now when you're talking to the church, that's it's another matter. There's something else now. Amen. God never told Abraham or anyone else that he loved the people in Sodom. Abraham didn't ask, make an appeal to him on the basis you, you made these people and you love these people. It's on the basis, is there any righteous? Is there any righteous there? Yeah, that's right. So that if it looks like our nation is going to be judged and it's increasingly looking that way, the question we need to be answering is, is there enough righteous people mm -hmm. in America to forestall the thing? Yeah. And I'm telling you, a lot of people are not sure. Mm -hmm. They hope there is, but they're not sure because the evidence is very sparse. Mm -hmm. We're being exposed on how God, how God thinks about this. Now, I, may, I mentioned several texts here where God makes statements about sin. And then I draw attention to the fact that most of these statements bring up Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting. They bring, he harkens back to this. Today, there's an astounding amount of written revelation concerning sin and its penalties. What God's going to do about it. And uh, in spite of that, there's a, there's a lot of insensitivity to sin, to breaking what God said, to violating God's nature, to violating his commandments. There's a lot of insensitivity to that condition. Now, if, you, if you're going to read the scripture, you will just not find a situation like that. Even Israel, who was God loved, set his love on them, chose them above all others, they finally tempted him ten times. That was it for that generation. They had to live. They could, none of them, not a single one of them could be recovered over a period of four decades, 40 years. Not one person could be recovered that, that was judged would fall in the wilderness. <coughs> but these men of Sodom, they come to the city and they ask for bring these men out so we can know them. And uh, here's what Lot says. I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as good as is in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. I know that is, that is a little difficult text, but we, can, we shouldn't be afraid to handle it. I have two daughters. Did it ever dawn on you, know, you that maybe Lot knew they wouldn't take his daughters, that they preferred men instead of women? Did you have, I mean, have you had this kind of thought? Or have you been so shocked that Luke said that, that you didn't think about this? <laughs> Yes, I think he, he pretty well knew. They, they won't settle for my daughters. And they didn't. They didn't. See, he was a righteous man, so he thought, mm -hmm. thought differently. And what it amounted to is this justified, this offer mm -hmm. justified the judgment on because it, it couldn't be averted. They couldn't, they couldn't consume their lust on something other than their own gender. A terrible thing. If we can rise to even a higher level than that, <coughs> God was in the whole matter demonstrating to men and men on angels the corruption of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, apparently, these two cities had gone kind of undetected. I think I get the picture that there's the insightful people knew about it, but it was generally unknown. A lot of travelers evidently didn't know about it. Said, don't do anything to these men. They've turned in here. 
right now under my protection. Now under the law, there was provision for what the scriptures call sins of ignorance, where the people did something they didn't know. They just didn't know. That's all. There was a special offering for it. <coughs> Confirmed God wasn't looking for a reason to condemn people. He even made provision for sins of ignorance. There's a parallel version of that in 1 John 1 7 that suggests this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. That's verse 9. Cleanse us from all sin. But verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, just like cleanseth us from all sin. Uh, not confess sin. This is the confession next. Not the worst. I would say this was a sin of ignorance. That would be the worst possible posture. I think I think I would must make room for the fact that Lot knew that they wouldn't accept this, this offer. And they didn't. They responded right away. Stand back. And they chided him because he'd been judging them. See? He had a reputation that wasn't good. This one, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. <laughs> now he's trying to tell us what to do. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? They pressed sore upon the man lot and came near to break the door. <laughs> They're aggressive. Before you stop with Lot's offer, and make some kind of assessment in view of what you, we know now in Christ, which wasn't known back then. Take that into consideration. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Because there's angels beholding, and he wants to demonstrate he's righteous in doing this. Here's an example to show you how that they, they can't be deterred. They can't be turned. Here's, a, here's an offer, and you would think if anybody could be changed, that would change their mind, what Lot said, but it didn't. He's going to be a judge among us. Oh, there's all kinds of, you're, who are you to judge? I was thinking is that this, what this does is accentuates the wickedness of the people. That's right. Like, like, mm -hmm. That's right. Well, I, I, I can't say the Lord prompted Lot to give the suggestion. Yeah. But it's, it's like it was set up in order to highlight That's the right. grossness of their iniquity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a question. Um, these two daughters of Lot, now does it mean later when it talks about their, their, um, yeah, we're going to cover that. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right, I'll wait. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do with the men say, we're going to, do, we're going to treat you worse. Mm -hmm. Now, what that meant, did it mean that more men would take him? Did it mean it be a more prolonged mm -hmm. subjection to their abuse to him? It, it, it's what it seems to be. Mm -hmm. They pressed hard. Tried, in other words, they tried to get past him yeah, right. to the door. But then uh, the men, the angels, mm -hmm. they put forth their hand and mm -hmm. pulled Lot into the house and shut the door, mm -hmm. <laughs> demonstrating their care for Lot. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that these men were angels is seen in the fact that not a shred of resistance was on their part. to be sympathetic with the Sodomites or anything like that. Yeah. Now in commenting on this event, mm -hmm. Peter said, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Uh -huh. Amen. Now there are some people in the world who probably would have been Sodomites, mm -hmm. but God knew how to deliver them. Yes. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So don't be parading a lot of has-beens in front of me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say they're not in. That's not for me to say. But don't 
this weakens the thread of reasoning. To have this approach to this kind of sin causes the magnitude of that sin to be diminished. And it should not because it's been given as an example to those who live ungodly. So they, they smite the men with blindness. That'll do it. Some versions say a blinding light. But it didn't, it didn't change things. They, they just, they wore themselves out trying to find the door. Hmm? It's kept by groping and groping and reaching and circling and wore themselves out trying to find the door. They worried themselves. The only reason they stopped is their strength was dissipated. <laughs> That's the only reason they they stopped. Now this is something that you kind of have to work out yourself, but you maybe have had the experience of some of your enemies finally like God gave you some rest. Of course, some people they don't, they never had enemies. They think it's wrong to have enemies. <laughs> But when your enemies, they kind of back off, maybe God's caused them to worry themselves, yeah, give you some rest, see. So having subdued this, the men turn their attention a lot and says, now listen a lot, any other family members in the city? Sons or daughters, any relatives? If there are, you get them out of here. Yeah. Well, let's see the angels aren't omniscient. As a valuable lesson we're going to learn here is that, again, carrying out the commands of the Lord, there's some discretionary privileges, decisions that can be made. It's got to be within God's will. The angels know what God's will is, so they can yeah. kind of work within yeah. that parameter. He says, any relatives you got, get them out of here. Because we're going to destroy this place. Because the cries, the cries have entered into heaven now and, it, and that can't be changed. Now God's going to do something about this. Must have been confirming when Lot heard the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord because they'd been vexing his soul every day. Right. So it must have been a great comfort to have this affirmed. I'm sure mm -hmm. he knew it, but sometimes bad circumstances can cause you to think more about yourself than about God, but it was must have been very reassuring to him. <coughs> we will destroy this place. Now there's a parallel scene here to the uh, judgment of Babylon the Great. God has made clear she's going to fall. Babylon is fall. He even talks in the present tense. It is fallen, is fallen. Babylon is fallen. So he talks in the present sense. I'm going to destroy this place. I'll get out of there. Come out of her, my people. That's what he said. Come out of her, my people. <coughs> they were, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not able to define uh, what does that mean. Uh, well, it's your business to find out what it means. You be stopping asking everybody else what it means and find out what it means. Yeah. God said that. You throw it in your prayers. God, I want to understand that because it's pretty plain what you said. Come out of her, my people, or you'll be partaker of her plagues. So I, Amen. You don't be sitting at home thinking about it like you think about a recipe or something. You determine to do what God said. Yeah. I got my hands full working out my own salvation, fear and trembling. Yeah. We're going to destroy this place. That's what he said about Sodom. In fact, he mentions, and he's talking about Babylon, the great city. Jerusalem is never called that great city. But Babylon is called that great city. <coughs> and in Scripture, 
Revelation 11:18. After the city had been consigned to destruction, they, God sent witnesses there. <coughs> and the citizenry of that city killed the witnesses, remember the dead bodies lay in the street, so forth. And here's what's said about it. Revelation 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. And some people say that's Jerusalem. Come on, people. Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt. That's where God put his name. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. This is talking about another city. Amen. And it's like Sodom and Egypt, both of which were destroyed. Yeah. See? Little different kind of destruction, but <clears throat> now we come to this task. Lot went out and spoke to his sons in law, <coughs> <coughs> which married his daughters. Now, a lot told these men, my daughters have never known a man. So how do you put these things together? <laughs> well, now, if, you, if you're familiar with Scripture, you can put it together. If you're not, well, then you'll, you'll have to listen to this. The Jewish writer, Jaco, concluded that Lot had two other daughters beside the ones there that were living in the city. Well, I, I don't... Because they're referred to as his two daughters, right. not two of his right. daughters. We know from other accounts of Scripture that those who were betrothed were considered married. Now, this is the way the Bible talks. And if you want to understand about Christ and the church, you've got to understand this, because this is how he talks about Christ and the church, too. <laughs> For example, <coughs> before Joseph and Mary came together, and while they were yet betrothed, Joseph is described as her husband. Amen. And Mary is described as Joseph's wife. That's before they came together. She's also referred to as his espoused wife. See, so that so <laughs> man couldn't get those two together, betrothed and like your engaged wife. See, that would make sense to, in our society, but that's, that's how they thought. Once you made up your mind who you was going to marry, it was... That was it. You weren't you weren't left free to do some open dating and see if there's somebody else. That's right. Not the way it was. Now this was so precise that before they came together, Joseph finds out that she's with child, and he's going to prepare a writing a divorcement. Even though technically they weren't together, married, but yeah, but they were betrothed, and that's as good. That's as good as you had to have a, a decree to separate the bond. Then, after he was all understood, him he he took unto him his wife. Yeah, even though she was betrothed. Now the same concept is in Christ in the church. Same concept is here. Paul states, for instance, that we're dead to the law that we should be married to another. Technically, the marriage has not yet been consummated. We're, we're preparing yeah. for the wedding. Amen. His wife is making herself ready. But you're considered as being married to Christ. Yeah. God's not going to give you the freedom to hook up with somebody else. Right. Yeah. You're betrothed. That's the answer to that technicality. This is just how the Jews, this is how God shaped their understanding. Because when he came to Christ in the church, he was there were going to be a certain circumstance he wanted to get across to the people that you are you are reserved for Christ before you're married to Christ. Yes, yeah. And if you live by faith, you can walk as a married person, even though technically it hasn't been consummated. Yeah, that's it. I was thinking, it's, it, it's another sign that that, that that Lot, even though he was in the middle of Sodom, living in Sodom, yeah. he still maintained That's right. <laughs> the things that he knew about God and what he knew about marriage. And what, he didn't follow their customs. He followed his own. That's right. His wife, his yeah. daughters were pure. <coughs> now, here's another word for the 
church. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Then it is another word to the same body. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her plagues. We shouldn't have to spend a lot of time on this. this but God's people have got to keep themselves pure. Now this has got to happen. It will exclude you from heaven if you don't. It will. After all of the philosophy about God's care and all of this, nothing unclean is going to get in. But it's your job now to keep clean. God's given you the resources to do it. So you can live like a married person, even though technically you've not been consummated yet. And there's a lot you can get from Christ now. But the sons, they heard this. He said, get out, get out of here. This thing's going to be destroyed. He's, you got to be joking. He didn't take him seriously. People have been saying that for a long time. Have you heard people say, oh, people have been saying Jesus is coming for years. Don't be telling me that kind of stuff. But he is coming, and the world is going to end. Right. There has to be preparation. And now escape is mandatory. Lot has to escape. When the morning rose, the angels hasted Lot, saying, Rise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. <laughs> See the angels there, when, they, when the destruction starts, they're no more pleas. Yeah, right. When the world starts going up in flame, no more pleas at all. Get out while you can. Make haste. But he lingered. <laughs> while he lingered. <coughs> I don't know why he lingered. After we learn a little bit more about his wife later, I can kind of figure out. But he lingered. Well, these angels have been sent to get Lot out of there, and they can't proceed with their mission till he's out. And when the world's going to be destroyed, it's not going to be destroyed till the sheep have been gathered out. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Separated. But the men took hold of him upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his daughters. See, God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. So here's, how, here's one way. Just take them and drag them out. <laughs> There's one way. That's what he did. Then he adds why the Lord is merciful to him. And this is like a holy angel taking hold of you. I mean, this could like be the end of your life. But it wasn't. It was a means of escape. So they normally, personalities that you couldn't contend with, they become your friends when God sent them to you. He took hold of them. Lord being merciful to him. He took them outside the city. Outside the city proper. <coughs> they set him down out there. Put him outside the city, some versions say. See, they didn't take him where they, he had to flee to. They didn't, they didn't take him there. Just got him outside the city. Set him outside the city. <coughs> now the heart of the destruction, that's Sodom. That's what's going to be destroyed. It's here. You withdraw yourself to get outside the city. Well, that, that's, that's still not safe. <laughs> you got to get beyond the periphery of destruction. Destruction's going to have a certain reach out so far. You got to get beyond however far the destruction's going to reach. Right. You have to get out beyond that. <laughs> that has to do with the world and it has to do with Babylon. <coughs> the Lord has plainly told us that the world's going to be destroyed. And he's told us, I don't love it. <laughs> don't love the world. What the things in the world. Because if you do, you'll quit loving God. Mm -hmm. That's just the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So come out. <clears throat> now he's got him outside the city. 
And he gives a word of admonition to him. Escape! Escape for thy life! Run! Get her outside the city. This angel knows this is going to, this fire is going to lick up this entire plane out here. It's going to be a widespread destruction. Escape for your life. <coughs> a lot of this is the situation. Maybe this is because he lingered, but he he knows I'm not going to make it to the mountain. Because they said, go to the mountain. I'm not going to make it to the mountain. I'm, I'm, it's too far. I imagine he's thinking to himself, well, I wish I hadn't dawdled around here. And so he makes a petition. He says, uh, Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain. It's too far. Lest some evil take me and I die. Maybe there'll be some beasts on the way up there or something. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto. It's a little one. It happened to be Zoar. It was the last city. <laughs> give you a map there. It has Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam. They're wiped out. Zoar's a little further down. It, it just let me go there. He has permission to go there. Not, not because he wanted to stay close to Sodom, because he, he didn't think he could make it all the way to the mountain. And these angels now, they have discretionary powers. They can do a little bit of negotiating. He knows how to ask. I found grace in your side. I mean, I'm here by your grace. I'm outside the city. I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead on the basis of that grace. <coughs> the angel said, I've accepted thee concerning this also. I just, you got to think about this angel's been sent to destroy the cities. And he listens to Lot, and he, he does a little bit of negotiating. And he says, look, I'll do it, because I can't do anything until you're out of here. So I'm going to let you go to Zawar. I won't just, I'll see to it that that city's not destroyed. <laughs> I'll not overthrow this city. It was targeted for destruction. There are five cities targeted, Sodom, Gomorrah. Adma, Zeboam, Zoar. Five cities were targeted for destruction. But because Lot was righteous, not because he thought things out thoroughly all the time, he was righteous. He said, I'll, I'll be lenient to you. I'll let you go there. I've accepted you. Mm -hmm. it was just, I've accepted thee. I've accepted you in this matter. Now, living for the Lord is much the same as angels carrying out their mission. We're given the intended outcome of salvation, be separate, saith the Lord, so forth. We're going to be conformed to his image. And she tells you what it's all about. Some people, for one reason or another, takes them a little while to get there. So they stop over at a Zoar. Yeah, it, it protects them for a while. Yeah, it protects them for a while, but then they got to get out of there. Yeah. I can't do anything till you come hither, and I am going to do my what I'm told to do. But I'm not. I I just kind of lifted you up and put you here, but I'm not going to take you up the mountain. You're going to have to negotiate it from here on. You're going to have to run the race. Yeah. So you're seeing a picture how God works here. Yeah. When we say you're delivered, <coughs> delivered doesn't mean all your problems are solved. Mm -hmm. Delivered means you're outside the circumference of destruction, mm -hmm. but you're not home yet. Yeah. You got to make it the rest of the way. See, so, so this is it's lived out right here in this in this text. And he gave him a right to go to Zohar, and, and the scripture says that. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar, and he had no sooner got there than the fire fell. So he just barely, he just barely made it. And I have an idea that righteous will scarcely be saved 
that there's a sense in which we'll all just barely make it. There's a sense in which we'll have an abundant entrance too. I understand that. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire out of heaven. And some people say, well, that was a volcanic eruption. That's what that was. Well, no, it wasn't. This was, as Jude said, eternal fire. So it was destroyed by eternal fire. Jude 1 7. It was a miraculous destruction. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that was grew up on the ground. Now I put a little chart down here. <coughs> if the Dead Sea is the area that was destroyed. <coughs> and many of you people think it is. I chart out how the large area that was. I tried to find a, a map of how these cities were before Southern Gomorrah. I couldn't find any. A, I mean, I spent too little, an inordinate amount of time looking for it, I couldn't find any of it. There was a lot destroyed when these five cities, the whole area, that whole plain, remember? This is the plain that Lot saw when he's up there at Mamre with yeah. with Abraham, he saw the well-watered plain. This, yeah. That's what this is, it was destroyed, this well-watered plain. Uh -huh. So the the uh, area was, was extremely large and the destruction devastating. And he comes back to us. He says, but his wife, his wife looked back from behind him, so he was leading them out. She's behind him. She looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. And there is a pillar of salt in that area that they say is Lot's wife. It's called Lot's wife, but it, it looked too big to be Lot's wife. But there is a pillar that looks like kind of like a human being. It's over there. She became a pillar of salt. Now Jesus, he commented on this with three words. Remember Lot's wife. Before you cast a fortuitous glance back to the world, or what you used to be, or what you used to have, remember Lot's wife. He just did this one time, that was it. She's a pillar of salt. <coughs> now when Jesus comes again, you're being prepared so you won't be looking back. You won't be lamenting that you're leaving behind certain things. Now the scene shifts. We go back up to Mamre, where Abraham is. He got up early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. That's where he had negotiated with this, if there be so many righteous, will you destroy them? Early in the morning, he must have spent a restless night, no patriarch. God didn't tell him, see, the outcome of this. He didn't know whether he found ten righteous or not, or whether Lot was spared or not. He didn't. He didn't know this, but see, faith survives without answers. It can do it. He went to the place where he talked with the Lord. Must have bolstered his faith to do it again. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. He didn't know what he was going to see now. He just saw billows of smoke rising up into the sky. The smoke of the country of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. And God had chosen uh, not to hide from Abraham what he's going to do, but God didn't know the Abraham didn't know the extent of it, but he he did, and he looked. He still doesn't know. A lot made it or not. So God destroyed the cities of the plain, overthrew them. And an interesting thing, then he goes retro, he goes back to before Lot was delivered. And he says, it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. Yeah. Not Lot, Abraham. Yeah. He remembered Abraham. 
And because of Abraham, he saved Lot. <laughs> but he didn't tell. I imagine he, Abraham eventually knew. But So God sent, sent Lot out of the midst. Well, it looked like he ran out. See, But he's, God sent him out of the midst of the overthrow. Overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. See, for Lot, safety wasn't a simplistic thing. He had to be taken out and set outside the city, and he had to he had to run, get away from the fire. This is God's manner. This is how God works. But it wasn't long that Lot couldn't stay in Zoar. Zoar, he was afraid to stay there, because he knew this city was slated for destruction. So he went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. In the cave, he feared uh, dwelling in Zoar. Now, I can't help but uh, note a parallel situation that exists with many believers of our time. Babylon the Great might be likened to the cities of the plain. Some people have managed for a while to find a little one huh, where they can spend it, at least kind of get their feet on the ground. But they, it didn't long they found out, well, this isn't the ideal situation. I got to get out of here and get up to the mountain. Yeah, it's a per perfect parallel. Yeah. <laughs> we got up to the mountain where he belonged. Now the scene turns to Lot's daughters. <coughs> Lot and his daughters are the only ones that survived this whole plane. Yeah. They're the only ones that survived. So we're not talking about someone that could take a little journey to the next town. It's, it's not like that. And the firstborn said, look, our father's old. And there's not a man on earth that come in to us. They hear, they hear about this destruction. Nobody's going to want to marry us. They, they, <laughs> they'd be scared. Well, you're lots of daughters. Oh, no, no, well, thanks. I don't want anything to do with that. See? So our father's not going to have any offspring, any seed. And see, that was very important in those days because God has to replenish the earth and so forth. <coughs> so she thought of this scheme. She says, now, there's just us three here. There's anybody else. You might stand at the door and say, is anyone else out there? You know, but there wasn't anybody else out there. You know, by themselves. So we got to handle this passage with care, you understand? So she reasoned that this wasn't driven by lust. This was not driven by lust. It was driven by wanting Lot to have some seed. And I'm going to show you that God wanted him to have some seed too. So they said, here's how we'll do it. Well, he'll not consent to this. Dad will not consent to this. I know that already. So what we're going to do, we're going to give him wine to drink. And then he'll sleep and he won't know what's going on. And I'll go into him. And the, and the next night after this happened, she said, Now I did, now you do the same thing. We'll give him some wine to drink. He'll go to sleep and be out of it. And won't know when we come in and we leave. And that way, he'll have some seed. Now, yes, in the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, this is a bad suggestion. I mean, we understand it. It kind of repulses you just to read it. But they didn't know now what you know. We've got to make that allowance. You find great comfort in God not holding against you what you don't know. This means something to you, doesn't it? Well, it should mean something about these people here, too. About 500 years later, God defined sodomy in the law. It wasn't defined at this point. In fact, sin had not been defined at this point in human history. God had made no definitive statement about sin at this time. So we can't reason as though they had. Doesn't justify the conduct, but it does tell us if you don't, if you're not knowledgeable, you will do some stupid things. What it teaches you. Because human reason it it tends downward. He can't man can't figure out 
the will of God. It's got to be revealed to him. We learn this from it without justifying the conduct that they, they were handicapped by their ignorance. Now there's two nations born out of this relationship. <coughs> the Moabites and the Ammonites. Lifelong enemies of Israel. And he tells you that uh, the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites. The younger she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami, the same as the father of the children of Ammon. So the Moabites and Ammonites came from, from this activity. <coughs> and both the Moabites and the Ammonites were judged by God. They, neither one were allowed in the congregation forever. Moabite, Ammonite, both of them. But that's not at all that's said about it. <coughs> the Ammonites worship false gods. Moabites worship false gods. But I want to close by something God said when the Israelites took over the land. Here's his words. The Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given it to Ar under the children of Lot for a possession. Ah, well, let's go on. And when ye come as nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. <laughs> now all this, this is what worked out. All of God worked all God worked all these together for good. Now you were given to see it. He does something similar in your life too. He's worked things together for good that it didn't look like they'd all fit together. Amen. The, but I personally I got a lot out of that. Yes, amen. Yeah. Lot. He rewarded Lot. I've given it for a position to Lot, and even though you're in the land, don't don't bother. Mm -hmm. Moabites and the Ammonites. I think I'll close there, but there's uh, it's a lot there.